Oftentimes in archaeology, scientists rely on radiocarbon dating to determine when a person or a plant or an animal died, or when a man-made object fashioned from plant or animal material was made. This might be the handle of an axe, the timber of an ancient house, or the clothes of a Viking maiden. Most things that were once living and haven't yet fossilized into rock can be dated this way. And in fact, many things that were never part of a living organism, like the fossilized impressions of human footprints, are also dated this way when scientists find seeds buried at the same geologic strata as those footprints. It's an incredibly powerful tool for understanding our past, and unfortunately we can't use it to date anything that lived in the 20th century and beyond. And future archaeologists won't be able to either. Let's dive into the reasons why, which might surprise you. First, we need to talk about isotopes. Back in 1913, an English radiochemist named Frederick Soddy was studying radioactive elements in his lab and trying to come up with some kind of grand theory of radioactive decay. He and a Polish radiochemist named Kazimierz Fajans discovered independently of one another that one kind of decay moved an element two places to the left on the periodic table, and another kind of decay moved an element one place to the right. In Sadi and Fajans' radioactive displacement theory, the leftward motion was given the name alpha decay, and the rightward motion the name beta decay. We now know that alpha decay is caused by the spontaneous emission of a helium atom from the nucleus, which we sometimes call an alpha particle, and beta decay is caused by the spontaneous emission of an electron from the nucleus, which we sometimes call a beta particle. But Sadi had a problem. You see, he'd been tracking the decay chains of various elements in his lab, starting specifically with uranium and following its decay down the periodic table to lead, 10 steps away to the left. His displacement theory, which held for so many other radioactive elements, couldn't fit the decay chain of uranium. As he worked through all the steps the decay chain must take to reach lead, he discovered that there must be something like 40 different kinds of atoms between lead and uranium. But as any glance at the periodic table will tell you, just as it told him then, there are only 10 elements between lead and uranium. Nevertheless, when he measured the radiation emanating from these unplaceable radioactive atoms, he could discern that some radiated one kind of ray, others a different kind, and some emitted the same kinds of rays but at different intensities. On a hunch, he tested whether these new atoms had new chemical properties, and he found something startling. They behaved chemically like elements that already existed on the periodic table, like polonium and radium, and yet the polonium that came from the decay of radon didn't emit the same kind of radiation as the polonium that came from the decay of bismuth. And there was even a kind of lead that was radioactive and decayed into bismuth, and another kind that wasn't radioactive at all and never decayed in his lab. Sonny had discovered that there were versions of our usual elements that were chemically the same, but radioactively quite different, and he called them isotopes, from the Greek isostopos, meaning in the same place. In this case, the same place on the periodic table. The discovery of neutrons was still many years off from Sadi's discovery, but we now know that isotopes are versions of elements with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. The radioactive properties of an isotope are determined by the number of neutrons in the nucleus, but their chemistry is determined by their charge, which doesn't change between different isotopes of the same element. Now let's look at carbon. The two most common isotopes of carbon in our atmosphere are carbon-12 and carbon-13, which are both extremely stable and not radioactive. But every once in a while you come across an isotope of carbon in the atmosphere that isn't stable. This is carbon-14, and it has a half-life just shy of 6,000 years. Carbon-14 is always produced at a constant rate in the atmosphere by cosmic rays from deep space striking nitrogen-14 isotopes. These cosmic rays induce an inverse beta decay, or a beta-plus decay, that converts one of the protons in a nitrogen-14 atom into a neutron, turning the atom into carbon-14. But remember, the chemistry of carbon-14 is exactly like carbon-12, so this carbon-14 atom bonds to two oxygen atoms to make CO2. Down on the ground, a respiring plant breathes in this CO2 molecule and uses the carbon to build its tissues and grow. And so at any moment in time, a living plant has the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 as in the atmosphere. Similarly, any animal that eats plants also has this ratio. But once the plant dies, or the animal dies, no new carbon is entering their system. The total number of carbon-14 atoms in their bodies is frozen at the time of their deaths. And slowly, over time, this carbon-14 decays back into nitrogen-14 at a predictable rate. The moment that tree branch was turned into an axe handle, the clock started ticking, 
and we only need to measure the ratios of carbon-14 to carbon-12 to read the clock. So why doesn't this work anymore for anything that died in the 20th century and beyond? At the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union, together with a few other nations, tested over 500 nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Among other things, these tests scattered a lot of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, far in excess of what cosmic rays were producing. So much so that radiocarbon dating a person that died in the 1960s today would give you a negative age for their remains, as though their body had traveled backward in time from the future. But the era of nuclear testing in the atmosphere is long over, and most of that extra carbon-14 has settled out, returning to the numbers you get from cosmic rays. So what's the problem with carbon dating now? Well, remember that the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in a plant is almost exactly what you find in the atmosphere. And one way to mess up this ratio is to add a lot of extra carbon-14 in the form of nuclear tests. But the other way is just to add a lot of carbon-12, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. Fossil fuels have been in the ground for millions and millions of years, plenty long enough for all of their carbon-14 to have decayed away, leaving only carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopes. When we burn these fuels and produce CO2, none of that CO2 contains carbon-14. And so the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is nothing like it was 100 years ago. Worse still, this ratio today is constantly in flux as we add CO2 to the atmosphere at unprecedented rates. And this trend doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. So in the distant future, archaeologists will have no reliable way to carbon date any of us. Because first we nuked the sky, and then we pumped megatons of extra carbon-12 into the atmosphere.